Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I am Heidi Johnson. I'm the director of the Agriculture Institute that is part of the Division of Extension at UW-Madison. The Division of Extension is a unique part of UW-Madison and we're the embodiment of the Wisconsin idea. We try to take resources, research, and information generated at UW-Madison and extend it to all people in Wisconsin. We do this through a unique staffing model. We have specialists that do applied research that can help solve the issues in our state. We also have county educators in every county of the state of Wisconsin that help they're embedded in their communities and they can help tailor the information that is relevant to the uh, needs of that community. Today, we're gonna be hearing from Kevin Sheshow and Phil Holman, who will be showcasing for us the Spooner Ag Research Station. The station was established in 1909 and has played a critical role in the ongoing development of crop improvement in Wisconsin. Kevin Sheshow is the Area Ag Development Educator uh, agent for extension in Burnett, Sawyer, and Washburn counties. He received both his MS and BS in soil science from UW-Madison and UW-River Falls. In addition to providing information and education to the area farmers on crops, soils, and alternative agriculture, Kevin also provides information and education to home and, uh, to home and commercial horticulture. Phil Holman is a superintendent and agronomy project researcher at the Spooner Ag Research Station. He grew up on a dairy farm near Baronet, Wisconsin and earned his BS in ag business from UW River Falls and his master's in soil science from South Dakota State University. Phil will be kicking us off for today. So please welcome Phil Holman. Uh, thank you, Heidi. Uh, the Ag Research Station and uh, what was formerly UW Extension, but uh, now is the Division of Extension, has a long relationship together, something that started in the mid 90s, something uh, called the Northern Ag Initiative, where ag or UW Extension ag agents were placed at a, a couple of research stations. And that has continued on so far at Spooner. Uh, incidentally, I was one of the agents at one time in one of my previous positions. So I uh, know a lot about the extension side of what goes on here, as well as uh, after moving away and I moved back again as the agronomy research program manager here, here at the station. And now to give everybody a little flavor of what things look like outside at, at Spooner and, and what is done at the station. We put together some video clips that have been edited and, and have, have uh, me talking about the station as well as the research projects here. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Phil Holman. I am the superintendent and agronomy research manager here at the Spooner Ag Research Station. The Spooner Ag Research Station is the northernmost station of the Ag Research Station system, and we are located about halfway between Eau Claire and Superior, kind of the northern fringe of the farmland and, and transitioning into the northern forest land. Uh, the Spooner Ag Research Stations is the oldest of the Ag Research Stations. It started in 1909 when the city of Spooner donated some 80 acres of land to the university so that the knowledge of the university could be spread throughout the area and research could be done on soils of, of northern, northwestern Wisconsin in the Spooner area. The University of Wisconsin College of Ag and Life Sciences has 12 ag research stations to be uh, field locations for researchers within the College of Ag and Life Sciences. These 12 stations all have different uh, topics of interest uh, to their region or, or specific purposes and some like the Arlington station which is the largest and closest to campus has researchers in all different departments of their, and areas. Uh, as I mentioned Arlington 
Another large station is the Dairy Forage Research Facility, which is a USDA location at Prairie du Sac, looking at forage production and milk production of dairy cows uh, from those forages. The West Madison Ag Research Station is uh, on the western side, uh, just south of Middleton, has a lot of horticulture research as well as crop production. Uh, Ag Engineering Department utilizes equipment on the field trials there as well. Located a little bit south of it in Verona is the Turf OJ Nor Turfgrass Research Facility that looks at commercial turfgrass needs, whether it's golf courses or athletic fields. Uh, the Lancaster Station in the southwestern corner of the state is a cow-calf beef operation as well as field crop production. And then as we head north, the, the Hancock facility is in the Central Sands area. It has vegetable, especially potato production research as well as the traditional farm field crops. Uh, coming further north at Marshfield is a dairy heifer production research and following through their first year of milk production as well as the traditional farm crop research uh, and research on the wet heavier soils in central Wisconsin. On the eastern side of the state is the Peninsular Ag Research Station for the apples and, and cherries. Uh, it, also in northern Wisconsin at the Rylander Station is very specific to the potato breeding and variety development uh, needs for the potato production industry and also the Kemp Natural Resources Station is for forestry and natural resources research in the Shaguamagan and forested area in northern Wisconsin. And here at Spooner, it is uh, all crop production. As I said, we started in 1909 and our, our history started with uh, subsistence agriculture as farming started in this area after much of this uh, land was logged. And in the early 40s and 50s, this was really the start of early season hybrid corn production uh, research was done here. And Art Strollman is a name prominent in variety development of early season corn hybrids. The many years, this station was home to a sheep flock, first focusing on meat breeds of sheep. And in the mid 90s till 2016, this was the only dairy sheep research facility in North America. Uh, with the retirement of the researcher, then that program was discontinued. Now the station focuses primarily on farm field crops, corn, as I'm standing in here, and we'll look at soybeans and alfalfa and the small grain crops, and then as well as any other crops that we want to see how well they transfer to northern Wisconsin. Whether we'll have hazelnuts, switchgrass, we've had sunflowers, canola, uh, all different grass species over the years. So we welcome you to the Badger Talks Live. This part is a little bit taped, but I am on online as well with this and I will bounce around the station for a little bit so you get to see some of the projects on the Spooner Ag Research Station. Corn is a major agronomic crop in the state of Wisconsin and a lot of different commercial companies sell all their different varieties of seed. And I'm standing here where two weeks ago we harvested this field as corn silage and it was uh, 50 different commercial varieties were submitted to that trial so that it was independently tested to determine the yield and the feed quality of, of the corn varieties. Uh, we have several corn trials on station. We have this corn silage trial, we have corn grain yield trial, corn on a soil pH, as well as corn on a nitrogen fertilizer rate and timing trial with different fertilizer project or, uh, products. So that then we can see how to most economically as well as environmentally safely grow our corn crop. Here we're in a soybean field, which soybeans are our next major grain crop produced in the state of Wisconsin. And being this far north, our soybean varieties are much earlier maturing, similar to earlier maturing corn varieties than those that are grown in the Madison area. 
So we test them at these different locations, different sites. And when we test a lot of different varieties in a small area, we want to make sure that the soil type or different differences in even in short distances of soil make make an impact on your yield. So we we farm actually in small blocks and this is a block that is only seven and a half feet wide by 25 feet long with a variety and the next block has another variety and the next block has another variety and we replicate this so we can statistically then determine with a degree of confidence as to whether varieties are better than others. So with our soybeans here today on September 22nd, we had our, our being far north, we had our first frost on September 10th this year. In the last 50 years, that is the earliest we've had frost by three days. So these soybeans, the, many of the leaves have, have died from frost rather than normal maturity, but it, it, that's what makes our field research so valuable is it's done on farm, in field locations, with natural variables such as the length of the growing season. So with our soybeans, we can look at varieties from early maturing to late maturing. We can also do soil fertility trials. We've had uh, trials looking at uh, white mold, which is a fungal disease that soybeans get many times during moisture conditions. So I have several soybean plots on station as well. And now we'll go and move to look at some of the other crops on the state research station. Here we have some alfalfa research. Alfalfa is major forage crop for our dairy herds, as well as feeding for beef and other ruminant animals. Uh, it produces the most protein per, per acre. And so it is a staple of the dairy ration. And so then there's a lot of research in alfalfa production not only variety trials, but also fertility trials, how much fertilizer should be applied so that we get, get high yields at our economic optimum. The trial that we have here is testing five or six different commercial boron fertilizers, which boron is a micronutrient needed only in about a pound per acre. So we have to do a lot of mathematical conversions to figure out how much pound goes into an acre with an acre being 43,560 square feet. So there's, it's, it's a very thin amount, but yet we can measure a yield difference with, with a very small amount of a micronutrient of fertilizer. Besides the major agronomic crops of corn, soybeans, alfalfa, oats, barley, or, or wheat, uh, this research stations get a lot of alternative crops. Here we have switchgrass, which is, is being looked at as a potential for biofuel industry. Can't, how much yield can we get in tons of dry matter per acre, as well as how much fuel, and ultimately could this be turned into electricity for use in our electricity needs in the country. Other crops that we have, we have miscanthus, which is another uh, warm season grass that grows even taller as a chance to will it survive in Spooner and, the, and how far north the, our station is get several crops as to see how far north can we push which crops in, in northern Wisconsin. A, as well as we have hazelnuts, we've had wine grapes, uh, sunflowers, canola, and, and many of the grass uh, forage species over the years. So every day it's always a different crop, a different thing, and, and it, so it's kind of fun working at the station, working with all these different crops and the research that is being done on them. As I mentioned, we work with all kinds of different crops. Four years ago, we started working with Julie Dawson in the horticulture department and a project she has called Seed to Kitchen, which looks at varieties of vegetables grown organically and how well not only do they grow and produce, but how well they taste. And in the Madison area, she has a lot of different tasting sessions with chefs in the Madison area. We grow a wide, wide range of vegetables. Here we've got a tomato trial that is part of a graduate student's research project where we are growing tomatoes. This is in a high tunnel greenhouse system. It is actually growing the plant right into the soil 
in the greenhouse and this greenhouse we built this year to be movable so we will slide it down the field to new soil next year so that we don't have the tomato disease pressure in the soil like you normally need to rotate your tomatoes in the garden. So we have the same different varieties of tomatoes in here. They are trained and trellised all the way up to the trusses. So you can see these tomatoes are eight foot tall or, or taller. And uh, we already had that frost that I mentioned earlier. The high tunnel here was closed up so the heat that was trapped during the day prevented this from, from freezing. And these tomatoes are going to produce later into the growing season. Now, as we compare and contrast that to growing right beside it, what is called a caterpillar tunnel, where we just have stakes in the ground and 20 foot PVC pipes looped over with plastic over the top. The plastic was down. I open it up so that you can see these plants, but this isn't a big enough, as big an area, nor was it as hot. And these leaves are starting to die from some of the frost that we had here. But again, these are surviving longer into the fall, into the growing season for your production on, on tomatoes. And we're seeing, again, the varieties in the high tunnel, the caterpillar tunnel. And then we come over just on the other side. And this isn't very pretty, but uh, Mother Nature dealt us a blow with that early frost. And you can see the tomatoes in our outside garden are already all dead and uh, we've picked all the viable tomatoes to take dad on those uh, other varieties or other species that are in the seed to kitchen is we have uh, peppers carrots cucumbers as well as uh, two different types of squash uh, butternut as well as maxima type squashes and uh, we've had melons on different years. So these are, these are uh, really generating lots of interest because everybody likes to eat. They're a food product, mainly for the fresh market growers that you get at, at the farmer's markets. Look at the data and this data can be found online. If you look up Seed to Kitchen, UW-Madison, you uh, search that, you will be brought to this and you can can see what the varieties do. And by having the varieties repeated up here in Spooner, four hours north of Madison, as well as at the West Madison Ag Research Station, we can see differences that some varieties that do well here don't do as well down there, and other varieties that do well there don't do well up here in our growing conditions. So as you can see, there's a lot of different crops as, as well as some horticulture and agronomic crops at the Ag Research Station. And I'll be online now for taking any of your questions after Kevin Shessel gives you a, an overview of the extension presence at the Ag Research Station. I hope you enjoyed the views around the station and the information about different projects that we have going here. Uh, being that four hours north, we're getting really close to peak uh, color uh, in fall. And uh, as you saw, many of the crops have, have died down. I really wanna thank Kevin for videotaping me and uh, the True Productions people sent us a, a gimbal to be able to do that. And our program assistant, Lorraine, has been invaluable as to helping the videos together so that we can see these and give you the presentation today. And next I'll be passing this off to Kevin and he can uh, explain the appropriate title and, and what his role in the extension and at the Ag Research Station is. All right, thank you, Phil. Um, again, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to share some of our, our work and our efforts here in, uh, in the northern part of the state. Um, Phil maybe didn't mention that uh, we are the most northern uh, ag research station in Wisconsin. And I'm uh, very, very fortunate to have this relationship with the Spooner Ag Research Station uh, to utilize the property kind of as an outdoor classroom for some of my outreach activities as an extension educator. So as Heidi said, um, my name is Kevin Chesso and 
I've been here at the Spooner Ag Research Station since January of 1999. So I've had a, a good stretch here of working uh, with Phil and other staff here at the research station to do some of the outreach uh, that extension does. So uh, I do have the responsibility, as Heidi said, across uh, three counties. Uh, but this station is really a regional hub of activity for uh, um, the surrounding counties as well. Uh, I work closely with uh, a, a grazing network and uh, you know, we utilize the research station for our farmer led council that was recent, recently started with uh, extension. So uh, this property um, is certainly uh, an asset to uh, the area and uh, I'm, like I said, very unique in the fact that uh, I've been able to do different projects. And the one that's going to be highlighted in this next video is some of my efforts in um, doing the horticulture outreach that uh, is always part of extension. And, uh, you know, we have an opportunity to demonstrate and to do a little bit of research in our teaching and display garden. And that is, uh, uh, what this next video clip will show. So again, I uh, hope you enjoy uh, my little virtual tour. This was shot about a month ago. Um, and like Phil said, we've had a killing frost. So a lot of the plant materials in the display garden have uh, you know, gone brown, but the uh, display garden is just a wonderful little oasis uh, hidden on the station property that's open to the public. Uh, the rest of the station property is um, signed, you know, to as no trespassing for obvious reasons, but the teaching and display garden or um, located off of Orchard Lane is open to the public. And uh, that's what I'm going to be highlighting here in this video. So enjoy, and we'll be back to take your questions when uh, the video is done. This is Kevin Chesso with the University of Wisconsin Division of Extension. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Spooner Ag Research Station's teaching and display garden, it's about a one acre property that's managed cooperatively and in partnership with the University of Wisconsin Madison College of Agriculture and Life Sciences uh, Spooner Agriculture Research Station. So we are on the research station property in northwestern Wisconsin. Uh, the other partners in our efforts here are, uh, of course, uh, Extension, and my position with Extension is the Agricultural Development Educator for Burnett, Washburn, and Sawyer Counties. And one of my jobs is to help facilitate and teach and uh, coordinate the Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Program. So those volunteers are the third partner in all of this and without their help uh, none of this would be possible so the display garden is located on orchard lane just east of spooner um, on highway 70. so we are open to the public um, practicing social distancing of course uh, but the display garden has many different themed beds and different themed areas and we hope that through our virtual garden tour you'll get to uh, learn a little bit more about some of those areas. Uh, behind me right now is our uh, pollinator sanctuary garden and that is focusing of course on pollinator habitat. Uh, we're an official monarch way station. Uh, this area is our pinwheel garden and we call that the pinwheel garden because there's uh, eight beds in a circle and it's adjacent to our windmill. Uh, following that, we will also have uh, other displays for vegetables and our children's area. In more normal times, we would be doing face-to-face -face programming out here in our children's area. Uh, we still have all the plants in place and uh, they're here for you to look at. This is a teaching and display garden, so we do things uh, differently out here every year and we're not afraid of our mistakes. Sometimes uh, those mistakes or just the displays we have uh, we call teachable moments. 
and the purpose of this display garden is to just let people understand what are the different types of plants that we grow out here and uh, um, how, how they're doing in this zone 3 climate. This is a teaching and display garden so we do different displays and different gardening techniques. Uh, in the background here you can see some of our cattle panels that we have pole beans growing up and over. Uh, we also have various beds of vine crops and off in the distance you can see our caterpillar tunnel. So again the purpose of this garden is just to display some of the different uh, plant materials that uh, people might try in their backyard gardens. Uh, we are also an official All America Selections display garden and as a result we have uh, um, any number of All America Selection winners both annual flowers and vegetables uh, that we will display as an official all-America Selections winner display garden. So you'll get a sneak peek at uh, some of those varieties that uh, were deemed uh, winners and this is just another reason to stop on out and check out some of those new varieties. So again my name is Kevin Shesso. I'm with the University of Wisconsin Madison's Division of Extension and uh, just wanted to make sure everybody is aware of this beautiful teaching and display garden here in northwestern Wisconsin. Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, little video introduction that I made. Um, you know, videos don't do justice, of course, to you know being there in person. Uh, but if you're ever traveling through northwestern Wisconsin, uh, the the garden is not that far off of main intersections, of Highway 53 and 70, and uh, we usually have a banner out at the corner of the intersection of Orchard Lane, uh, alerting people to the fact that hey, this is the the intersection to turn to the garden. Um, and as I mentioned, we're an All-America Selections display garden. We've been very fortunate to be honored by the All-America Selections in uh, winning a number of awards. Um, and uh, the garden, Federated Garden Clubs of Wisconsin have also honored us with a, their bronze award. So we get the, the caveat, I say it's a, a, an award-winning garden. Uh, that's not what we sent out to do. Uh, but like I mentioned in the video, our master gardener volunteers are essential in uh, this partnership. Um, and that's where the outreach happens. And uh, we do a number of events out in the garden. And I do see that there was a question that came in in uh, the chat box about what type of events and programs happen in the, in the display garden. Um, and uh, I've always viewed this space as an outdoor classroom. Again, this is a University of Wisconsin-Madison property. Um, and uh, like I said, we have access to it to do various projects. Uh, Phil has talked a little bit about the research and all the data that we're collecting from uh, the property for the uh, scientific uh, discoveries in agriculture. But the display garden is really meant for uh, the general public and the gardening uh, public and some of our uh, fresh market commercial vegetable growers uh, doing CSA and farmer market. Uh, so the, the programming in the garden starts with our spring pruning of our grapes. We have uh, two rows of grapes in the teaching and display garden. And actually the photo behind me is taken uh, out in the teaching and display garden. Uh, we have a row of table grapes and a row of wine grapes. And we'll start our spring programming and outreach in the teaching and display garden with that hands-on uh, pruning display of uh, the table grapes and the wine grapes. Uh, so that would be our kind of kickoff event. We have hosted numerous uh, school groups. Uh, we have a service learning project day for the uh, area um, middle school here. Uh, the Spooner Middle School students come out and they spend an hour or so out in the teaching and display garden, garden helping us clean it up. And we always have an opportunity to do some teaching. So 
uh, we'll gather the kids and we'll talk about something that's happening. Uh, the water tower and the windmill are a really uh, interesting concept. I didn't talk a lot about that, but the windmill has an air pump associated with it. So we pump our water from a, a underground well into an elevated tank. So that's another one of those teachable moments and we can work um, math into that discussion and talk about you know, how that works or some physics. Uh, so again, there's plenty of opportunities to do teachable moments in the display garden. And then as we get into the growing season, uh, the garden is open, so people wander through and they'll watch uh, the plants grow. Uh, our master gardeners have had a program called um, Meet Me in the Garden, and that's a monthly um, outdoor uh, event. It's held in that center pinwheel, and uh, we'll have numerous topics throughout the season, uh, depending on you know what, what's uh, appropriate for that time. Uh, we've also recently gotten a lot more involved with our children's programming. Uh, we have a children's uh, garden area and we have a, um, a children's garden program that's set up to meet like every other week uh, throughout the growing season. And that again is uh, managed by our North Country Master Gardener volunteers. Uh, so Extension uh, has a role, but the Master Gardeners also do a lot of the outreach with that. And the big event that uh, this is the first time in 22 years, just like a lot of things this year, that we could not uh, host our annual Twilight Garden Tour. And that event has grown substantially over the years and will top out somewhere around 300 people. It's an you know, outdoor event, obviously, and we have speakers that we invite. Uh, a lot of them are from UW-Madison or other extension uh, staff, but we will bring in other speakers uh, from industry groups and highlight uh, the, you know, all the things that are going on in the garden and we'll have tastings and displays and we've even had music out in the garden in the past. And then we wrap up usually with uh, putting the garden to bed kind of thing um, that we talk about you know, what's appropriate to do in the fall. So that's just a quick calendar of events for the display garden. Um, and I don't know if there was uh, another question that came up that I needed to uh, programming. Uh, yeah. Um, so I don't know, Phil, if you wanted to, I think there's another question. So what we're going to do is we're in kind of a Q&A session right now. And uh, Phil Holman is also still here live to take questions related to the crops or some of the other uh, questions that might come in. So. Um, there's a question here, Phil, that maybe you want to ask about what happens in the winter. And yes, uh, I, mm -hmm. I can take that question. Uh, in the winter time, uh, things slow down quite a bit here because we aren't uh, doing any tillage or harvest uh, or maintaining of plots, but we, we have a, a large selection of buildings and equipment to maintain. And we always keep a list of uh, what could be upgraded during the year, uh, with our research plot equipment, because a lot of our equipment is really pretty specialized. As I had in the video in the soybean field, a lot of our plots are only either five to 10 feet wide by 20 to 30 feet long. So we need to be able to make applications either of different seed varieties or different fertilizers really uniformly across those size of areas, as well as harvest each of those areas separately and harvest get harvest weights, uh, save samples if needed for researchers in Madison. So we, we have a lot of projects to do in the wintertime. Uh, the staff here and myself, there's really only uh, three of us in the summertime along with uh, some summer help for the seed to kitchen as well as a demonstration garden. But in the wintertime, uh, one of those staff is, is laid off for the winter and the other one is put down at halftime. So, uh, it's a lot of just me and uh, preparing, ordering seed, ordering materials, uh, writing up reports on the previous year's research data, and uh, putting together information for either for publications or for working with other researchers. So it's, uh, it's still things to do in the wintertime, but it's, it's a much different uh, balance as we get into the wintertime. Uh, Um, and I'm assuming that would be, well, the research station property, um, you know, we have had 
uh, groups that can come out. Uh, certainly we host farmer field days and, and events that are open to the public. Um, and that, you know, that is targeted, of course, more on the agricultural side with some of the research projects, if we want to highlight those. Uh, the display garden, I think, has a, a much wider appeal to the general public. Um, and yes, we do host um, uh, any number of groups in, again, more normal times. Um, those are usually prearranged. So uh, we do have, uh, you know, garden clubs and uh, we've, you know, sometimes had, you know, even bus tours stop by. Those all have to be prearranged, of course, because, you know, we want to make sure we can accommodate them. Uh, so we do some of that and it's again all by, um, you know, I guess you have to call in advance. Uh, but self-guided tours, certainly, uh, you know, people can just drive in and, and walk through the gardens without a special invitation. So um, local schools, uh, you know, if we can get them here, uh, transportation, of course, is sometimes an issue to get kids out of school. Uh, but yeah, we've had numerous school groups and, and other organizations arrange for uh, tours of the, of the garden. And potentially we can include some other uh, side tours of uh, some of the research projects if it's appropriate. Okay. Uh, yes, the the station has held uh, different uh, agronomic type field days as as we have research trials and topics that uh, are of interest uh, in in current hot topics. Uh, the general regular yearly programs don't don't generate as much interest. But we last year we had a fall uh, soils. Uh, health and management type field day, showing off the different research trials on on cover crops, as well as the trial with the farmer led council that is local here in the Yellow River and uh, in nearby waters watersheds, as well as then showing off the nitrogen rate plot so that when people can see differences in plots visually. Ultimately, though, we, at the end of the growing season, then when we have yields and, and information, we can share that with people either disseminated through the, the extension system or in uh, university other publications. Right, and I, I would also uh, chime in here that there is a public meeting room uh, that is part of the research station uh, you know, headquarters building where uh, both extension and the, uh, you know, College of Ag and Life Sciences have their, their offices. So, you know, extension is kind of on one end of the building and uh, uh, UW-Madison cattle staff on the other. And then in the middle is this beautiful meeting room that's used for any number of public events. Um, and we do have uh, meetings in the winter months in that space. And, you know, that would be for any number of different topics for, you know, our, our local audiences, either, you know, farmer um, or, the horticulture stuff, our master gardener volunteers uh, host their meetings there and we do different trainings, uh, pesticide applicator training, tractor safety, uh, youth tractor safety training. Uh, the research station has been a really great partner for that because we get to use uh, some of their tractors and the property to, to do that. So the research station is, like I said, a, a pretty central hub in the community here in providing you know, not only the property and the research, but the facilities that uh, that meeting room is used all the time, um, and that's I think another great you know way to share what goes on here and let people know that UW Madison has a, a presence here in Northwestern Wisconsin. <clears throat> uh, one of the okay, Kevin can take that. Uh, what was the question? Is how do you handle Japanese beetles in general, or was there a specific? Uh, let me see here. Um, well, uh, I guess there is some advantages to being north. Now, I'm going to jinx myself here because uh, for, like I said, I've been here for over 20 years, and all those years we have not had significant Japanese beetle pressure, um, either, you know, in our, in our uh, home horticulture crops or even in some of our agricultural crops. But lo and behold, Japanese beetle is slowly marching north, and uh, we do have uh, more reports of it. And I, I believe, you know, if you're anywhere downstate, you've been dealing with this pest for a long time. And, uh, you know, on our grapes, uh, we don't do anything specific because we don't really have high pressures. But uh, I think anybody who has to deal with Japanese beetle, um, 
Netting is a, a very common thing. You can do trapping, uh, but it's always about the threshold and how much damage the pests do. Um, there's any number of, of control options, either uh, more synthetic with uh, some of our insecticides or even organic methods. Um, and exclusion and netting plants is one uh, when you really want to protect uh, high valued crops. But like I said, we're, we're really not uh, having to deal with those in any significant way. And I would encourage people if they want to learn more about a lot of different subjects, you know, do an internet search on the subject like Japanese beetle management, and then put in extension or UWEX into the search box and you'll get all kinds of great information uh, from UW Extension on some of those different topics. <clears throat> um, okay, I will answer the, where are the studies available? The Ag Research Station has a website. If you Google the, the Spooner Ag Research Station and then we have included on their studies results and that links to a lot of the other researchers direct websites, whether it be corn, soybeans, small grains. Also in the video, I mentioned this uh, for people that are interested in the seed to kitchen uh, vegetable trials. The seed to kitchen has a website where then they have both the yield and quality uh, tasting ratings for the different varieties of tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, squash, melons, uh, carrots, pota and potatoes that are grown either here at Spooner or at the West Madison Ag Research Station. Yeah, I, um, I see there's another question here from Lloyd uh, about uh, fish farming. And apparently he's uh, got an aquaponics uh, uh, facility and he's interested in uh, sharing that and, and helping people learn about all the different types of aquaponics and fish farming techniques. Um, and I would say, you know, Extension is always open to uh, potential partnerships uh, to help educate people about any number of different topics. And uh, I know the university does have an aquaponics um, facility and uh, they do outreach in that area, I believe. Um, uh, UW Stevens Point is, uh, is where some of those staff are. Uh, but again, an internet search uh, on that, I think would really get you, you know, connected with some of those resources through UW Madison and UW Extension. Uh, okay. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, being on with us today and uh, let Kevin say some final words. Yeah, again, it's been a, a real pleasure to uh, have a little larger audience in, in sharing some of our work and uh, using some of these virtual technologies. It's been a, a real learning curve for all of us. And I think it's definitely going to be something we want to continue to do in the future. And I want to thank uh, uh, Fran and Anthony with the Badger Talk Lives uh, for helping us with the technology and, and making this broadcast happen and giving us the opportunity to share what happens outside of Madison. Um, UW-Madison is a wonderful uh, land-grant institution and everybody knows all the great things that happen in Madison, but uh, there's lots of uh, things that happen outstate, and uh, this is just one example of how uh, UW-Madison reaches you know, all corners of the state. So uh, again, thank you, and um, I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>